We are the paradoxical ape. Bipedal, naked, large-brained. Long the master of fire, tools, and language, but still trying to understand ourselves. Aware that death is inevitable, yet filled with optimism. We grow up slowly. We hand down knowledge. We empathize and deceive. We shape the future from our shared understanding of the past. Carta brings together experts from diverse disciplines to exchange insights on who we are and how we got here. An exploration made possible by the generosity of humans like you. Thank you, and thank you for inviting me to this fascinating symposium. I will be addressing the, today's topic in the domain of quantity and number. So many animals have the capacity to discriminate quantities and amounts, for example, while foraging, looking for uh, fruits that are ready to be eaten from those that are not, uh, or let's say looking at uh, predators, amount of predators or prey. So the question is, are these uh, phenomena in the domain of the perception of quantity or conception of number? And these are questions that are normally addressed in the domain of numerical cognition. Now, with respect to today's symposium, we could place this in the area of comparative numerical cognition. But here we have to step back a little bit in the sense that uh, different fields take the term comparative slightly different. For example, in the domain of comparative anatomy, it is very clear that we can do interspecies comparison, for example, looking at the size of the skull in different species, for example. But as you move along down to comparative to neuroscience, where you would need, let's say, a nervous system, so as you move along down this list, uh, you would have comparative linguistics, which involves only human languages. So the question for us today is gonna to be, well, what about comparative numerical cognition? Where would that fall in, uh, along this uh, list? So what do we know? Well, certain things we know. For example, many species are able to discriminate small amount of things. For example, dots, uh, when they're in a small range, you know, what we call two or three or one. But as soon as you have more elements, then it's much harder to discriminate these amounts. And this is called, subitizing, and it's a phenomenon that's been studied by experimental psychologists since the 1940s. Another capacity that is shared, humans share with many other animals is the capacity to discriminate uh, proportions, for example, of black dots versus white dots when the proportions differ substantially. But when they don't, and they're relatively similar to each other, then it's much harder to discriminate these, these uh, amounts. This capacity is called a large quantity discrimination. Now, some people and some domains and some uh, fields interpret these as being already mathematical capacities. Uh, so people speak of monkey mathematical abilities based on this ability in these capacities, or numerical and arithmetic abilities in non-primate species, or let's say numerical cognitions in bees and other insects. And then, of course, um, the media sometimes um, publish jump, you know, splashy titles like New York Times saying many animals can count some better than you uh, or referring to the origins of numbers when you look at um, animal data. And let's say a title like this one, Fish as Good as College Students in Number Tests. But there's a different source of uh, data with different kinds of interpretation that look at many uh, human cultures that do not have their practice of counting and they don't have terms for numbers beyond the subitizing range and many of them exist in the Amazon uh, area 
and also in the Aboriginal Australia. So this had been referred to, for example, by Caleb Everett as anumeric cultures and anumeric languages. So we are, here we seem to have a clash between the data that comes from, let's say, from animal cognition, saying that you know uh, bees and other insects can count, uh, and at the same time having the problem of human cultures with very sophisticated languages and smart people adapting in very challenging environments, not counting. So uh, in the first group, you have primarily data coming from animal cognition, child psychology, and cognitive ne neuroscience. Um, and I put here a tilde indicating that it's not all of them, but it's many people with more a nativist approach. And on the other hand, we have more anthropology and linguistic typology uh, bringing the data I was just describing. So we seem to have an impasse between what is being reported and particularly when we want to address the question, is there an evolved capacity for number? So the, the group on the left would tend to say that there is a biologically evolved capacity that is specific for number and arithmetic. Whereas on the other side, we would have a capacities for numbers are emerge from cultural practices and uh, learning and language. So what do we find when we read these articles is that um, quite a bit of a confusion in the use of the terms, for example, numeral, which is a sign for number, not number itself, or the definition of counting, or what is arithmetic and what is mathematics. So the term, when we look at the literature, we see sloppy and inconsistent concepts within and across disciplines leading to different views. So if we want to do comparative, um, comparative work, we need an ambiguous and terminology, and clear concepts, and sound theories. So what are the problems that we identify? Well, on the one hand, we can see that there's loose terminology, as I was saying, and unfortunately the term um, number uh, is used in everyday language, like in passport number or phone number, and also in technical domains, ordinal number or transfinite numbers, and those tend to be different, very different notions of number. Now, as we said, the literature is filled with the confusing terminology, how number is used, and sometimes is referring to many of these concepts here, or sometimes refers to something that is exact, sometimes is approximate, sometimes is symbolic, sometimes is non-symbolic. So when it comes to, comes to talk about numerical cognition, then we have a problem of what really is hidden under this term numerical, when we say numerical abilities or numerical processing, numerical stimulus. Another problem that we can identify is an overinterpretation of trained animal data. So results from training are often arduous and, and, and require considerable environmental support, in, intentionally concocted and designed by humans. So, for example, if we, let's say we can teach, uh, we can um, have monkeys learning how to walk on stilts or a bicycle, but the question with respect to the evolution of locomotion in primates, we need to ask, is that really useful or what do we learn if we want to address that question? So something similar happens when we train animals in our environmentally, uh, humanly designed environments uh, when we put these animals into these heavy trainings. So the training process usually follows extensive and dedicated training, which sometimes takes years to complete. For example, a quote from a practitioner says, here, training a monkey on a simple quantity match to sample task can take over four months and 20,000 trials, only to achieve discrimination of collections at a three to four ratio with a 75% accuracy. So train, uh, the trained animal data really inform many interesting questions. There's no doubt about that. But it's not necessarily about biological evolution and biological endowment. Another source of problems is that there's a, this been pretty much a disregard for crucial human data. So while most numerical cognition studies have been done in industrialized societies with writing practices, well-established curriculum and schooling from young age and so on, this poses a problem for evolutionary claims. So we want to know, for example, how is quantity handled in non-industrialized societies? And in this case, we can see that all known cultures that use, in one way or another, natural quantifiers, terms like English few or several or many and so on, but by no means they all exhibit exact quantification. So for example, a recent study, um, a survey in Aboriginal Australia of nearly 200 languages from 13 different linguistic families, 
um, reported that nearly 90% of these cultures lack numerals beyond five. So this is words or terms or expressions that go beyond the subitizing range. And similar results have been observed in groups of hunter-gatherer uh, cultures in South America and in Africa. So in some, uh, language by itself does not lead to number, appears to be necessary but not sufficient for exact quantification, which seems to be a cultural trait, not a specific, specific biological trait. So some distinctions are needed here. So while we know that some animals have a capacity to discriminate, let's say, chromatic uh, experiences, let's say red from green, uh, or the quantity, amount, when we say that this group here, the top group, has nine elements and the one on the bottom has eight, we are involved in symbolic reference. And this is, appears to be exclusively human capacity. We could refer to this in other languages like nueve and ocho in Spanish, or using Roman numerals or, let's say, other bases in mathematical notation to refer to these quantities. So what is really number when we take this counting classic familiar list of one, two, three, and so on. Well, we have at least seven properties. So first is that number exa quantifies exactly. It is abstract in the sense that it transcends uh, immediate perception or modality, or let's say visual or acoustic and so on. Uh, they are relational. So for example, numbers refer to each other, like eight is a product of four and two and so on and so forth. But importantly for today's pre presentation is that numbers are referred to symbolically. So really, number is exact symbolic quantification. Now that appears to be substantially different from what we observe in uh, trained animals in the lab, which whatever phenomenon we observe is mainly achieved via associative learning. So good science needs clear non-confusing concepts. So how to properly refer to biologically endowed quantity related phenomena that do not satisfy the prototypical number properties? In other words, in this picture, how do we refer to this part of the picture? Well, we can't really call that numerical in the sense that it lacks properties like symbolic reference. And it's not really quantitative in the sense that it's opposed to qualitative. So we refer to it as quantical, quantical capacities. So if we have a, here a schematic representation of handling of discrete quantity from small amounts to larger amounts in center periphery wise, here on the bottom left, we have, let's say, subitizing and large quantity discrimination, which we share with many animals and is fall in the non-symbolic domain. But symbolic references, reference allows us to have another type of handling, which uh, allows for natural quantifiers and exact quantification. Natural here, like few, many, and so on in white, and then exact quantification in blue, going from oral language to written practices into increasingly more sophisticated mathematical notation. The point is that quantical cognition is biologically endowed, while numerical cognition is not biologically evolvable. And here I'm gonna quote Terry Deacon, saying symbolic reference must be acquired by learning and lacks both the natural associations and transgenerational reproductive consequences that would make such references biologically evolvable. So exact symbolic quantification beyond subitizing range appears to be motivated by cultural preoccupations, tracking variables, stock management, trading, accounting, and so on, and is supported and enhanced by tools and offloading cognition. It requires enculturation. For example, Incas in South America did not have writing as far as we know, but they had material anchors to support calculations, for example. Or uh, grammatical and lexical tools, as been reported by Nick Evans in Papuan languages. Or, of course, writing technology, which was invented only 6,000 years ago. In any case, all these cases require conventionalized symbolic reference for exact quantification. Now, when there is number, it's commonly expressed in base five or base 10. Maybe because we have five fingers in our hands, pentadactylism, which is an anatomical trait. The thing is that many animals, many mammals, and uh, have this trait. Pentadactylism is observed in gorillas, in monkeys, and raccoons, and as I said, many, many other animals, bats and seals and so on. So here we have an evolved anatomical trait 
that is present in many animals. However, symbolic reference is not present. So the hand cannot be recruited symbolically for, let's say, counting. And another important aspect is that even in the case of humans, it's not that because we have symbolic reference, we have one way that is genetically determined for how to keep track of numbers using our bodies. The work of Bender and Beller has shown many variations across human cultures of how, for example, the number eight is characterized using our anatomical feature of pentadactylism. So what happens when there is written exact symbolic um, number? Well, even in that case, seems to be mediated by culturally shaped cortical phenotypical plasticity. For example, Tang et al. showed that with a numerical task um, given to English native speakers and Chinese native speakers, um, you would have a different kind of recruitment of neural populations, for example, in the English speakers, um, more activity in the perisylvan area, you know, Broca's an, uh, area and Wernicke's area compared, compared to the Chinese group and so on. So exact quantification or number then is really is a, not a biological trait, but a cultural trait. It builds on biologically evolved preconditions like subitizing and large quantity discrimination, supported by symbolic reference, which is not biologically evolvable, brought forth by cultural practices and preoccupations, along with biological phenomena that support teaching, learning, and specific phenotypical plasticity, biological enculturation. So number, with respect to our topic today of in comparative anthropogeny. Well, although ubiquitous today in the industrialized world, numerical cognition like geometry, music, or visual arts should not be taken at a face value. The answer to the question of what it takes to move from quantical to numerical cognition is not trivial. Indeed, only some humans in the right socio-historic context and after tens of thousands of years have made that leap. So we have outstanding questions, of course. For example, what selective pressures may have given rise to quantical cognition? What does it take to move from quantical cognition to numerical cognition? What is the role of natural quantifiers in the consolidation of exact number in children? Building on quantical cognition, how does exact symbolic quantification get grounded and neurally instantiated? And ultimately, how does biological evolution accommodate and support enculturation? symbolic learning and cultural evolution in the human species. These are questions that now, uh, along with colleagues Andrea Bender, Francesco De Rico and Russell Gray, we're starting to um, address with a recently awarded grant by the European Research Council uh, in our project Quanta, Evolution of Cognitive Tools for Quantification. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you for all the students who have supported this work and the uh, funding agencies, and I'm happy to take questions when uh, at the end of the session. Thank you. <laughs>